again, good morning. It's good to see you. These are precarious times we're living in still, huh? I was kind of hoping that once we went back to just no restrictions, everything would, like that, go back to normal. But it, it seems to not be the case. So we're going to continue to hang in there and see what happens as the weeks roll out. We may have to start wearing masks. I see some people are wearing masks out there, and that is quite all right and, and fine. Um, but it may, be, it may be required in the future. And if it is, we'll go ahead and comply. But until then, we'll just enjoy that feeling of not having that on our face for those of us that aren't wearing it. But in the meantime, we're going to continue on in our series that we have been calling Enjoying the Feast of Life. And before we begin, I want to just do a little quick experiment with you. If you go ahead and just close your eyes for a second and go ahead and just picture Jesus, what you think Jesus looks like. What's that common image, anyway, that comes to your mind, that first image? When you often think of Christ, you got the image? Okay, go ahead and open your eyes. I just wanted to have you do that short little exercise. You know, I can remember the first time I saw a non-white Jesus. Remember the, the Jesus that I kind of grew up with, the blonde hair, the blue eyes, right? The white, kind of pale skin. and. Um, I remember it was, in a, it was in another Christian denomination, and Jesus was of a di different ethnicity, and I remember thinking to myself, what that stop me? But then over the years, I had to uh, do some studying, and came to realize, well, actually, Jesus was a first century Jewish man, right? And so he probably didn't, he probably didn't look like many of the people that we used to hang out with in, in the Midwest looked like, right? <laughs> Pale, you know, white, uh, but had some color. And wasn't exactly how we traditionally think Jesus looked. Actually, many cultures um, who have been influenced or embraced Christianity have Jesuses that kind of look like their culture. I don't know if you can see some of those uh, pictures from where you're at, but you've got different Jesuses here. We have the European Jesus, which is the one that you and I are most, mostly familiar with. We have the Japanese Jesus, we have the Native American Jesus, we have African Jesus, Arabic Jesus, Korean Jesus, Chinese Jesus, and even Indian Jesus. Wow, that one, that one's quite different. <laughs> we have all these uh, representations, these different Jesuses. You know, in today's text, we see that the main obstacle to receiving the kind of life Jesus was offering as the bread of life we see that the main obstacle to receiving the kind, that kind of life was to confuse him with just another ordinary human being. That was a big obstacle. In other words, the people were unable to receive the life Jesus was offering because they believed that Jesus was on the same level as any other ordinary person. By the way, I don't think there's anything wrong with representing Jesus like that. I just wanted to illustrate for you how we tend to kind of wrap Jesus in our own culture, and in so doing, oftentimes, reduce him to just another ordinary person. And the obstacle to receiving the life of the bread of life is to do just that, to reduce Christ to just another ordinary person. You'll recall in verse 42, when Bert was reading, we heard these words given by the people. Isn't this Jesus? Joseph's son, whose mother and father we know. In other words, we know this guy. We know who his family is. We know where he's from. He's just an average person. He's just, he's just right, he's the, the guy next door. So how can he now say, I have come down from heaven? See, Jesus is, is claiming to be associated with heaven. He's claiming to be divine. Yet the people see him as only earthly which limits their ability to enter into the eternal life that Jesus offers, a life bound up in understanding who he truly was. So, we see that knowing Jesus is central to enjoying the kind of eternal life he offers you and he offers me. And that leads us to our big idea for today, which is we know the person of life in the uncommon Christ. We know the person of life in the uncommon Christ, the Christ that is not simply a common, ordinary person, that is. 
So, as you know, we've been in this five-week series, enjoying the Feast of Life. And we started off by talking about the picture of life. And we said the picture of life is given, do you remember? The feeding of the 5,000. And we said that that was a representation of grace. When Christians talk about the spiritual life, that's where they start. They start with grace. They start with a good God who loves us and comes to us and sustains us irregardless of who we are, what we do, and any of that. And then we moved on. We said, actually, though, the, what, what does it look like? What's the perspective? Uh, we said it was faith. We looked at last week. We looked at the word faith. And we, we unfolded what, what it meant to be people of faith, people who put their confidence in Christ. And today we want to focus on the person, Jesus. We want to focus on the person of Jesus. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Is Jesus a man? Just a man? Is he, is he a prophet? God? You know, that, kept, that, that question has captivated millions down through the ages, hasn't it? Even up to our own day, there was a, I remember a popular book that came out a few years ago by a, a non-Christian, uh, I believe he was a Muslim uh, scholar, um, named Reza Aslan. It was called Zealot. Anybody heard that book or read that? Yeah, Zealot. And there was a lot of good things in that book, a lot of good information in that book. That book was actually um, uh, Reza making available to the general public what was kind of ordinary knowledge among many scholars, um, which was simply this, that Jesus was a social reformer, that he was a social reformer who tried to bring in God's kingdom. Uh, there was something not too long ago called the quest for the historical Jesus. I don't know if that's a familiar term to some of you, but it was actually a series that I think was on TV for quite a while, where there were some scholars who were committed to simply a, a naturalistic worldview, a non-spiritual worldview, or at least a worldview that was uh, saying that matter is all that mattered. But anyway, they came from a very naturalist, secular perspective, um, and they basically talked about Jesus apart from an understanding of the spiritual life, or Jesus apart from the under, his understanding from the church, or apart from his understanding from a, a faith perspective. It was a very scientific analysis of Jesus. And many good things came out of that, um, out, out of those programs and out of that research. Unfortunately, it left out a whole lot of other stuff too. Because Jesus was just simply seen as a great moral teacher, a, a Jewish prophet, uh, a wisdom teacher of the first century, a healer. Some of them even suggested that Jesus was a magician, that he was a miracle worker. Students of history say Jesus was like every other mythological hero in the ancient world, that he was made to appear divine like the Caesar of the Roman Empire, who was also said to be the Son of God and, and divine, even born of a virgin. So that Jesus was like many of the mythological heroes of old, the old, ancient, uh, dying and rising God of Egypt. So the, the godlike stories told about him are akin to essentially ancient legends. The divine Jesus it is often said it's just a mythic description based in the common features of how ancient cultures told stories. Some believe the question of who is Jesus unanswerable, since Jesus never wrote anything, and all we have are the writings of his followers, and therefore we shouldn't take them seriously. Now you compound all of that with our pluralistic age, where all claims to uniqueness or even a truth with regard to religion becomes highly suspicious and much resisted against. And you get a recipe for essentially ambiguous. We just can't know. Right? Like what we see in our text, essentially. The many differing voices regarding Christ and the pluralism of our age seem to obscure any unique relevance of Jesus causing him to either recede in the background or take his place as one among many unique but uh, ordinary teachers. 
How many of you have heard the name C.S. Lewis? Do you know who that is? Yeah, sure, he had a big effect on the church. C.S. Lewis was a group as an atheist and uh, became a Christian under the influence of people like J.R.R. Tolkien. And you may recognize that name. He wrote the famous Lord of the Rings. Uh, C.S. Lewis also wrote the famous uh, uh, children's stories, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Well, as Lewis began to be influenced by uh, Tolkien, who was a Roman Catholic, and others, uh, he began to be open to Christianity. And he started to be open to God first, and then later on, he found Christianity to make most sense of reality. And as he began to grow in popularity, something that he did not like, if you know anything about Lewis, he did not like the spotlight, um, he was asked to offer some radio broadcast messages um, through the BBC um, right before World War II, right as, a, as they, they were entering, I think, World War II. So he was called upon to offer really some comfort. And the series of broadcast messages that he gave, which were um, uh, to common people, ordinary people, on the radio each evening, they were short, they were probably 15, 20 minutes long, if that. And those talks would later be put together and be called Mere Christianity. How many of you have heard of Mere Christianity or read the book Mere Christianity? I'm going through it again, and it's just a lot of fun to go through that and to see what he said. Lewis spoke to this issue about Jesus and the challenge of the many differing understandings presented. There was Lewis there, and there he, uh, there's that, that, that microphone. And he, basically, he spoke to this issue about Jesus and the challenges of the many differing understandings presented about Christ in a world that was becoming more skeptical, more pluralistic, and more hostile to the claims of the supernatural. When talking about Jesus, Lewis said this, and I quote, I'm not going to do this in a British accent, by the way, okay? Because my wife would be really embarrassed, okay? <laughs> so just, just hear the British accent behind my words. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, that is Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall down at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Do you hear Lewis's point there? His point is, you either have to accept Jesus according to what he taught, and you can't say he's a moral teacher because what was the essence of many of his teachings? Believe in me. I've come from heaven. Right? I'm the Son of God. I'm divine. So we either have to accept that or say he was cuckoo, or he's a liar. And when you go through the New Testament witness to the character of Christ, and if you take those as authenticated witnesses, you have to say, well, he wasn't a liar because he's represented as someone who's kind of being honest and telling the truth. Nor does he exhibit the characteristics of someone who is a lunatic. See, what Lewis is trying to do here is eliminate the tendency to make Christ common. The same as any other moral teacher. And so he forced people to make a decision. This is called the trilemma. It came to be known as the trilemma, anyway. He's either a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. He's either bad, mad, or God. If I was in Massachusetts, I'd get away with the third rhyme, right? Bad, mad, and gad. But we're not in Boston. 
Whenever one thinks of this, the point Lewis is making is that when it comes to Jesus, you either have to take him as Lord, as the guide of your life, the center of your existence, or leave him. Again, you could agree or disagree, but that's his point. That's what he's trying to say. Jesus is either central or he's peripheral. And I think this is John's point in John's gospel, in the gospel text that was put before us. The spiritual life depends on how we see Jesus. Is he common or is he uncommon? Is he earthly only or is he also heavenly, divine? Is he human or human and divine? Now many responses can be given to these issues which are quite complex, when we, what we raised about a little bit, of who Jesus is. But that, this is not the time or the place to try to unpack all of that. But notice this. Notice how Jesus speaks to the people's supposed familiarity with him. Notice what he says in verse 43. If you can't read that, don't worry, I'll read it for you. Jesus responded, don't grumble among yourselves. See? That's what the children of Israel were doing a lot in the, in the wilderness. Right? They were grumbling and they were grumbling. Even when they got some of the bread, they didn't want the bread. They were still grumbling. Man, uh, and here we have again just kind of the... This wilderness scene being repeated again. God is providing. God is giving. But the people is not giving the way that people want to be uh, getting here. And Jesus says, don't grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless they are drawn to me by the Father who sent me. And I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets. And they will all be taught of God. Everyone who has listened to the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. I assure you, whoever believes has eternal life. What is Jesus saying? What is he doing here? He's saying, those who are going to come to me are those who are being drawn by the Father. As it says in the Bible, the Old Testament. And then he quotes a verse. And the verse says, they will be taught by God. So Jesus is saying, see what your own Bible says? There's going to be a time when there's going to be a direct correspondence between God the teacher and the people the student. There's not going to be any mediators. It's not going to be hard to understand. There's going to be this time where it's going to be very clear. God will be the teacher. God will reveal. God will come to the people. And it will be the people's job to either hear or not. Who are the ones who come to Christ? Who are the ones who come to Christ? The one God the Father draws. How? By teaching. Through the teaching. Let me be very clear as to what I think Jesus is saying. Those who will see the uniqueness of Jesus and therefore experience the life that he brings are those who are willing to be taught by God. Those who are willing to follow God in terms of what God has revealed. Not what we think about God, but what God has revealed. But, but, but how is that done? Everyone who has listened to the Father and learned from Him comes to me, Jesus said. Everyone who is open to what God reveals can be drawn to Christ. Everyone who is open to what God reveals can be drawn to Christ. So what's the point? What's the point? The point is that we have to be living in the truth, open to the truth. The Jews of Jesus' day, who were following what God had revealed in their scripture, in their history, in their Old Testament, and how it related to Jesus would be doing just that. For us, what would it look like? It'd be following what God had revealed in Christ. And that could be through nature, that could be through the, 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 the natural revelation of the natural world. We can start there. I think Lewis started there. But then there's also the special revelation. There's the revelation of changed lives in the name of Jesus. There's the revelation of Scripture and the witness uh, to God through the Scripture and to Christ. And there are other witnesses. But the point is, it's by following what God has revealed in Christ. To this point, I just want to spend a couple minutes and then we'll bring this to a conclusion. I want to bring in Dallas Willard here. Um, and he says something very helpful. I think that can elucidate what I think Jesus is trying to bring to us or what we can gain from John chapter 6. 
um, University of Southern California philosophy professor, but also a very committed Christian man, Dallas Willard. And he said this, he says, don't start by trying to believe the big truths about Jesus. Start by putting into practice the things he said, trusting him to be right about it. And if you do that, you'll gradually find out what a big deal he is. I love that because it's a door into the heart of God, not through our logic or trying to prove something, right? Because that's what we want. We want to we want to be, we want to prove ourselves into the kingdom of God, right? We want to prove ourselves and have all the proof. But here the proof comes in the pudding. The pudding of actually putting into action the teachings of Jesus and seeing if God shows up or not. It's a very different way of thinking about it, isn't it? When we talk about living in the truth. Usually we're, when we talk about living in the truth, we're, okay, go ahead, prove it, and then I'll see, right? And here's another way of thinking about it, right? By, by the way, if we approach our spouses like that, right? <laughs> Some of us have, it hadn't worked out, right? <laughs> right? I'm going to be in a relationship with you. Before I can trust you, before I can know anything about you, I've got all my expectations of what I think should be happening, and I'm going to put those expectations out. Before I can know anything or have any real truth, you've got to meet all my expectations. Go ahead, go for it. Okay, first day over. <laughs> right? That's how we come at, though, in the, in the spiritual life, in a relationship with Christ and God. Instead of forcing someone to believe a doctrine about Jesus being the Son of God, just live. Just live what he taught. That's how you find out what he's really like. Willard goes on to say, don't try to make yourself believe something you don't believe. He said it again. Don't try to make yourself believe something you don't believe. Belief is not something you can do by choice. Okay? It comes as a result of finding reality. Reality brings belief. So you can't know something unless you're actually willing to change your life. And that's the standard expectation, by the way, in human life. We want people to know things by trying them out. And again, just think of... How you get to know someone? How you got to know a spouse? How you get to know a friend? You didn't do it by front-loading all your expectations, right? At the beginning of the relationship, it's saying that they had to meet all those expectations for you to know them, right? It, when it comes to a relationship, a real relationship based in faith and trust, we enter and we, we learn it by our experience, by submitting ourselves, by listening, by watching, by interacting. You see, that's how we... We do it in the realm of persons. And when we talk about God, we're talking about something that exists in the realm of persons. Unfortunately for many people, God exists as an idea. And so the way we relate to God is conceptual. I agree, I disagree. It makes sense to me, it make, doesn't make sense. So God is real when it makes sense, God is not real when it doesn't make sense. It's a very conceptual way of thinking about God. But a Christ-like way of thinking about God is a personal way. Because we believe God is personal. And now we're in a relationship. And so we need to adjust our expectations. If we've been approaching God from a very bookish, conceptual perspective, we need to readjust and remember that God is a lover, a person, and we have to submit ourselves and interact and listen and relate to. You see? We don't think of knowing God in that way because a lot of us, again, think of our relationship of God in terms of like an armchair conversation, right? We have that kind of armchair conversation relationship with God, right? But in the realm of persons, armchair conversations never get you there. Right? Willard goes on and says, you don't have to come to know someone by having an armchair conversation. You come to know someone by having a relationship with them. It's acting with them with them. So, brothers and sisters, the best way to know God is act as if he was real and put your life on the line and then see what happens. See what happens. So we return in conclusion to our main idea. We know, we know the person of life in an uncommon Christ. A Christ who is very human, but also very divine. 
God draws us to God's self through Christ and his teachings. So the degree to which you and I follow the teachings of Jesus will be the degree through which Christ, excuse me, to the degree to which you and I follow the teachings of Jesus will be the degree to which you and I find God and the eternal life he freely offers. And when we're living in the reality, we'll know Jesus. We'll know Jesus to be more than just a carpenter's son, more than just the son of Joseph and Mary. We will behold for ourselves the Son of God. So I leave you with these two questions to consider this week, today, maybe throughout the week. How does Jesus relate to your spiritual life? How does Jesus relate to your spiritual life? Who is Jesus to you and how does he relate to your life? Is he a concept that you have to agree? It's all about agreeing or disagreeing. Is he a real person, a spiritual being, still alive and wanting to interact with us? Secondly, would you be willing to take some of his teachings and put them into practice in order to discover for yourself a deeper revelation of who he actually is? That is our mission, that is our description as, as students of Jesus in the divine life of grace and love and justice that you and I are called to as Christian people. So may God give us the help, may God give us the grace to do just that. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I want to invite our ushers up as we collect our offering at this time.